The Joust of Kings, a Broken Realms short story. Click, clack, click, clack. Surrounded by flickering witch flame candles, Volkmordian watched the grandfather clock chime in his heart of his sanctum. The master of the bone tithe had always possessed an appreciation for timepieces. In each necropolis raised by his legions, nestled amidst shelves packed with scrolls and ledgers of conquest, Volkmortian made room for the reliable, ticking serenade. This was one of his newer acquisitions, wrought from the thick ogre bone. Volkmortian owned many such osseous devices, and many of more traditional make also, if only to prove the superior crisp precision of the former over the latter. Few bone reapers understood his fascination. Xantos did, but then the old general was as much a stickler for precision as the tithe master himself. The great necromancer had never demanded his herald dispose of the affectation. Had it been ordered, Vorkmordian would have done so in a moment. But even being crafted to serve as the vessel of his god's will was no reason to abandon every quirk out of hand. As armored feet thumped upon flagstones, Vorkmordian turned to watch the doors to his sanctum grind open. Though his face was, as ever, a mask of sculpted bone, the tightness in Horik Venzai's posture indicated he wished to be anywhere but here. Striding across the floor of the scroll chamber, hand resting on the pummel of a sheathed blade, the liege Cavalos attempted to disguise how lost he seemed without his steed through prideful swagger. Still, the nod of acknowledgement he gave was genuine enough. High Emissary. I thought we might play a game. When he was not booming out ultimatums, Volkmortian's voice was an abyssal, but not entirely unpleasant whisper. Catacros had once described him as sounding miserly, though the Mortark had likely meant it as a compliment. As he spoke, the emissary gestured to the ivory table beside him, and the chair pulled in close. Ven's eyes stared for a moment before giving a grunt. The liege circled the table and the board set upon it, before sinking into his seat. The heavy sarcophagus eternally bound to Vorkmordian's frame prevented him from doing likewise. Instead, he moved to stand across from his opponent as Venzai picked up a crystalline playing piece. You have a new set. Originating from Ultri, so I'm told. Xanto sent them to me. The Hishian's craftsmanship is exquisite. The emissary nodded, pleased to share the knowledge. Annoyance flickered with him in as Venzai merely grunted again and set the piece down. I've never had much aptitude for King's game. It came as a surprise to some that the Ossiarchs played games. Yet as Volkmordian saw it, his people were no mindless revenants. They were a culture, and a culture must have its pastimes. Of course, every such game was based around the principle of strategy and logic. Even through their distractions, Catacros sought to hone his armies. King's game was one such distraction. At its core lay elements taken from peace-capturing games found across the realms, discarding anything considered superfluous or overly reliant on chance. It was played over a tiled, two-tiered board. What occurred on one impacted the other, and pieces could move between either parts at points, just like with the realms and the underworlds. Different tiles possessed different attributes representing forests, mountains, or likewise. Most notably, King's Game used a third, neutral set of pieces that either player could employ to disrupt their opponent. Yet while this faction remained in play, neither side could claim victory. It was a matter of risk and reward, and knowing when to alter one's plans. Only the best could time it just right. You'll be in good company then, Volkmordian said. Once, he had aspired to be a commander to rival the Mortark yet had quickly discovered that it was neither his talent nor his passion. Still, he hoped Venzai would not go easy on him. As Nagash himself knew, though he would never admit it, one learned more from a well-fought defeat than they could ever learn from an easy victory. The emissary took the opening moves. Volkmortian could sense Venzai's surprise as he advanced his pieces upon the bottom of the board in complete neglect of the upper. Though most players of King's Game espouse decisiveness as the key to victory, Volkmortian's early motions were circumspect. He probed the extremities of Venzai's territory, testing where he could stand and where he could not, committing nowhere, yet slowly closing off regions of the upper board through his position of the lower. As he did so, the Tithe Master murmured, Are your defenses ready? Emissary? In Praetorus, Volkmortian clarified, as he finished opening another cautious assault. 
As Van Zai began his next turn, the emissary saw he need not have worried about a simple game. The liege's plays were those of a soldier, but not without flair. Even as he launched a steady assault, advance upon the upper board, the Osiarch expertly organized the majority of his pieces to deal with the lower. A tight wedge of controlled aggression soon bore down on Vorkmordian's scattered resources, removing them one by one or sending them into retreat. You still think the counterattack will come. Even as he snorted derisively, Venzai's agitation deepened. Try as he might, he could not bring enough force to bear against Vorkmordian in any single location to break him. The intricate wheeling maneuvers and frontal assaults he mounted were exemplary, yet in that lay the problem. Volkmordian's pieces flowed around Ven's eyes like the shrieking night winds of Delorum. He did not seek to blunt engagement, instead closing off paths to the upper board when it was advantageous to do so, employing them himself where it was not, changing the tempo and the center of the conflict in time on his own whims. When he surrendered board control, it was to gain in the fracturing of Venzai's slab-like formations and the steady dwindling of his rival's patience. You are too aggressive, Horik, Vokmortian chuckled, as he assembled a knot of his pieces now gathered on the board into a defense. Predictably, Venzai's vanguard moved to swamp them, even as the Tithe Master shook his head and slipped more pieces behind his enemy's advance. The Mortark of Grief's armies already move on Settler's game. Whatever the result, we would be fools to presume there will not be retaliation. Better to stand in readiness. Let the elves try it if they like, Venzai snarled, his attention entirely upon the twin boards as he commenced his next turn. Those are our strongholds, and you have bigger things to fret over. Too late, Volkmordian saw the ploy. By surrendering the lower board prematurely, he had allowed Venzai room to prepare an initiative-stealing reversal. Pieces he had considered scattered and meandering suddenly moved as one through the upper plane spreading their influence across the tiles that the Tithe Master's calculations had erroneously deemed irrelevant. Losing ground in the face of its coordinated, intractable assault, Volkmordian's hand at last strayed towards the neutral pieces, thus far untouched. Even as he sacrificed these outliers in an effort to slow Venzai, the Tithe Master saw himself play into his opponent's hand once again. Unable to concentrate his resources in any one location, forced to fight on multiple fronts, he could only watch as Venzai swept the remainders and unaligned forces round to bolster his already strengthened center. It was all Vorkmorian could do to stifle the choices of angles and of advancements and watch as Venzai's pieces punched through his stretched defenses. Impressive, Liege Kavalos, Vorkmorian nodded as he repositioned and attempted to regain some control. I see why you and your dreadlance have earned your reputation. Venzai's reply was silence his advance subsiding as he continued to regard the uppermost board. Long seconds dragged by, punctuated by the predictable ticking of the bone clock. Wilkmordian's finger moved to tap on his staff in time with the slow noises. If there was one thing he could not stand, it was a deadline being missed. Has your nerve failed you? You play a strange game, Emissary, Venzai muttered, gaze not lifting. Even now, your pieces are clustered about the mountains here. Had you abandoned it and retreated to the lower board, returned to your lockdown strategy, you could have perhaps stymied me enough to force a stalemate. That's what I would have done. The leech Kevalos was right. Volkmortian had not even realized it. Yet in the back of his mind were the whispers of the great necromancer rasping against his own thoughts. The Tithe Master had suspected it had not been coincidental. Part of being a god's vessel was that it became difficult to tell where you end and they began. I suppose I have, he said at last, giving a nod. They will counter and seek to humble us, so we will turn back upon them, and it will come down to the mountain in the end. The mountain? Do not be obtuse. The mountain. Some say the stone heart of Emetrica was the first thing in creation. Endless in his way. You know the master will take umbrage at such claim, and Hish will suffer for it. If you say so, Emissary, I welcome it, Venzai shrugged. Either way, your strategies have proven inadequate. I have opened you up and put you to flight. Above and below, all dances to my tune. Does it? Volkmortian's query was not rhetorical. Nagash's herald stared at the plain gray space standing just a few tiles from where his crystalline hosts 
clashed against his rivals. Earlier, he had moved the thing up in a desperate attempt to slow Ven's eye, and discounted it as lost. Yet now, through some quirk of fate, this one piece was poised to threaten the core of both voices. One decisive move either way, and the balance could swing. It was King's game at its finest, yet something about that sight sat poorly with the emissary. A sliver of information, recorded in one of his countless ledgers, boiled up on Biden. There are mordants in Emetrica, Volkmordian supposed, lifting the piece. One of them names himself an emperor. If that is all, then I do not see how there is anything for us to worry about. Perhaps, Volkmordian nodded. It seemed an ill-fitting explanation, but then again, what else was there? Try as he might, the emissary could not grasp it. Murmuring wordlessly, he sat the piece down again. After a few long moments of staring, Volkmortian moved to reset the board. Contemplation only went so far. Eventually, everything simply had to be tested for true. A draw, we shall call it. Let us go again. All right, friends, Doug here, and I want to talk about this story just a bit because there's a few things going on here that I found really quite enjoyable. One, I feel like... Um, Everyone who's ever played a game of Warhammer wants to have like a cool menacing conversation while they're doing it. Instead, we just talk about the weather and stuff. Can we just normalize, you know, plotting, I don't know, not doomsday stuff, but just cool events throughout history as we like brood over a game of Warhammer? That just sounds fun. It's ridiculous. It's it's just all craziness. Anyway, um, the story, I like it. You know, essentially it is essentially, it's basically the emissary of Nagash sitting down and, and, kind of gauging and playing a game with mental game, not just the actual King's game with a, a subordinate essentially. And I like how their dialogue weaves between what's happening on the table and the events that are happening in the grand scheme of things in AOS, because this encounter right between these two uh, bone reapers has to be right. Let's see. So it would have been after settlers gain. And so because they said the night hunts have already invaded, um, maybe at the same time Nagash was being visited by Teclas. It's in that gap between the Lumineth full-blown assault into Shaiish and when the story of Broken Realms Teclas started. And if you haven't seen that, I do have a whole week's worth of videos about Broken Realms Teclas. It does start with Nighthaunt invading Settler's Gain, and then it quickly rolls into Lumineth kind of retaliating, but there's not one of the criticisms I had of that book is they're not giving us a lot of time, like um, a sense of what is happening and when. And so this is this is a story that must have taken place in between those. But we're seeing a new side, I think, to the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, one that actually makes me like them a lot more, which is they when they were first kind of previewed to us, right? The idea of like, they were these constructs uh, and then they technically they are, their bodies are constructed from various bones and even their souls are constructed from bits of souls here and there. But this is a little bit different because when I think construct, I typically think like something fairly mindless, but the idea that no, 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 we put all these things together, but they're like a self, you know, they have a sense of self is probably what I'm trying to say, uh, where they, have games, they have entertainment, they have hobbies, right? Uh, they like games like King's Game in this and also clocks. Like what What other kind of strange, I don't know, interests could they possibly have? And that's something I find hyper interesting because if somebody can have an interest or an icon that they like or just something that they enjoy, it adds so much character. And that's something you can definitely bring into your war games. Now, as far as the actual content of this story, I wanna be honest with you, there's not a ton. Right, I mean, basically, uh, this was a story that came out right around Broken Realms Teclas, meant to kind of set up some of the events. They mention uh, the Mountain of Hish, which was integral in that story at the in the last video that I did. Uh, it came out to be a very important piece, but ultimately, it's about two Ossiarch Bone Reapers mentally playing a game to see how do we think this is all going to pan out. And while it doesn't introduce new concepts in the lore or doesn't radically change anything, it's not showing us a ton of stuff behind the curtain, I do think it's an important story for adding, uh, I guess, character to the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. It's very easy to look at them and see mindless, you know, undead drones, kind of like how skeleton warriors are often depicted, that kind of stuff. It's like, no, 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 they have personalities. They, they go about things in different ways. They like different parts of art and culture, but there are these hodgepodges of mentalities and 
expertise and souls and all these kinds of things so they can create some of the most interesting characters because you might have someone who has multiple interests from multiple people because their souls were ripped out and smashed into one i like that idea so anyway i enjoyed this story it got a little bit wordy as they were trying to describe the game i'm like i don't know what the heck we're talking about but uh, i did enjoy the idea of seeing what is essentially warhammer in the warhammer universe is what i'm going to call it and i like it quite a bit when the Liege Cavalos was like, hey, you ran up the board too early, that kind of hit home for me because anyone who knows or has played against me, that tends to be my strategy of just like turn one, run and charge. I like armies where I can run and charge and just bolt up the board as fast as possible and be aggressive. Uh, and that's that's just me. He called me out, right? I feel seen. I like it. This is how I play war games. And I also, uh, you know, when I clearly lose, I say, hey, you know. Let's call it a draw. And I try to get them to shake my hand. I'm just kidding. That's 100% a joke. But absolutely, I thought it was a fun thing. Let me know uh, what you thought about this story in the comments down below. And I will catch you then. And happy wargaming. <laughs>